now that we figured out what the future form of agriculture should look like that's regenerative helps diversity and is best for the planet we say um we've put this life tree process together and it's just asking the right questions and 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 going through the the right steps of protecting your field and planting trees that improve the soil putting fruit trees that feed the family and then trees growing up above and trees growing down below and all of these different elements might be very different um if you're in Senegal or even Gambia but the general framework of the design you know it, it stays the same is your field protected or does it need a fence Welcome to each of you from all around the world no matter where you're coming in from We are so happy that you've joined us for this presentation Living Fences and Living Soil and the Impact on Environmental Justice Today we will be focusing on two countries in West Africa Senegal and the Gambia I am Beck Mordini the Executive Director of Biodiversity for a Livable Climate For 10 years Bio for Climate has been sharing the science and the stories of the power of restoring ecosystems to stabilize the climate. We're delighted to bring you this presentation in partnership with GBH Forum Network as part of our Life Saves the Planet program. So audience chat is disabled so that our great team from GBH can use it to share relevant links and information with you. But we will have Q&A towards the end and so if you just click on that little Q&A button and put your question in the box We'll try to get to it during the presentation. Let's see. Yeah. All right. We are very lucky to have with us today people with a deep history and understanding of the issues of restoration in this area. So let me introduce to you all three of our speakers. John Leary is the author of One Shot: Trees as Our Last Chance for Survival. and he has planted over 250 million trees over the past 20 years. He is the founder of Mother Trees and is expanding his vision of tree planting into a complete system for community revitalization. He has dedicated his life to helping communities around the world to design and implement landscape restorations programs that re rehabilitate farms and restore forest ecosystems. He is joined with by Pam Agoyo also of Mother Tree. She is a passionate advocate for habitat preservation and animal conservation. She's serving as the president of the El Paso Zoological Society and leads initiatives to raise awareness about climate change, deforestation, and sustainable living through education, youth programs, social media, and community engagement. Pam serves as the lead ambassador for Mother Trees and is developing tree cover restoration initiatives in Africa. We are also lucky to have Mariama Fatajo. She is a small business development specialist and the founder and CEO of Tefa Development, a social enterprise that empowers small businesses in low-income countries. And she will be speaking of her experiences with the Gambia. So we have Senegal and the Gambia. Let's see. I think that is all. We can get started with John and Pam. Wonderful. Thank you, Beck. Thank you, Beck. For that wonderful introduction there. Great. Thank you. It is abundantly clear that our farming and food systems are degrading our world's many ecosystems and we need to change how our food is grown. Tonight we're going to take you on a virtual tour, a virtual trip to West Africa to see how Mother Trees and Tefa, two organizations working for environmentally regenerative economic development in West Africa along Gambia and Sinsalan rivers and at the heart of tonight's discussion is the question of how are we going to feed the future monocrop farming has degraded nearly every landscape on earth particularly over the last 75 years and tonight we'll talk specifically about peanut and rice monocropping in Senegal and Gambia and both are leading to desertification of the land and the destruction of the rivers. And there are people out there who would want you to think that we are dependent upon agrochemicals, hybrid seeds and technologies to feed the planet. But both of our organizations here, Mother Trees and Tefa, are working to fix degradation, hunger, poverty, 
left in the wake of this monocrop farming. And tonight we present a new and better way forward. Tonight our planet may also likely lose a couple more species, but we'll also gain a new strategy of how to avert the climate and biodiversity crises. And we invite all of you to get involved. Our vision is a world where natural farming and forest conservation provide optimal health for people in biodiversity. So we are on a mission to harness the power of trees, making agriculture regenerative while combating the urgent challenges of climate change and deforestation. And tonight we'll describe our comprehensive solution, the Life Tree System, which we have designed to be a replicable and regenerative pathway out of poverty for families living on degraded landscapes. And before we start looking about how planting millions of trees is transforming these landscapes, I'm going to turn it over to Mariano Fatajo, showing us how chemical fertilizer destruction and the sustainable practices are working out for Binta and the hippos in Gambia in West Africa. Mariano. Jerry Jeff, John, I suppose by now you are speaking Wolof. Um, uh, good evening, everybody. I am Mariama Fatajo. I am an international development specialist dedicated to linking ecosystem services with livelihood development. And I founded TEFA in the Gambia in 2012. Uh, this is a social enterprise that empowers communities by guiding them in engaging in sustainable livelihoods that increase their personal and household incomes and then transforming these livelihoods into sustainable businesses that create jobs and serve as a tax base for the nation to boost economic empowerment, allowing for improved education, uh, also improve health and living conditions overall. So operating uh, in a largely agriculture-based economies, our work is deeply rooted in eco-restoration. And also we contribute to environmental justice as well as generating jobs and supports the uh, national economy. This to us is our sustainable model for development. I am here in the U.S. pursuing graduate studies on sustainable international development at Brandeis University's uh, Heller School for Social Policy and Management, thanks to the generous funding from the Joint Japan World Bank uh, Scholarship. Uh, my professors and colleagues from Brandeis University are tuning in, tuning in right now. Uh, shout out to, to them. Um, on the problem that John mentioned earlier, which is also the focus of our discussion here tonight, uh, in our work, environmental justice is key to community prosperity and addressing these injustices faced by those most vulnerable to environmental degradation remains our top priority. Therefore, we work on ecosystem restoration projects like reforestation, combating desertification, and watershed management. Uh, this way, we restore degraded landscapes and empower local communities. A case in point, meet here Binta. Binta is one of the members of the community we work with at the community called Jahalipachar in the Central River region of the Gambia. By the way, folks from the Gambia are also tuning in. Shout out to them. So Binta once thrived as a rice farmer in the area. At the peak of her uh, livelihood, she harvested enough rice for her family's consumption in one year. And also she had excess and generated around $1,000 uh, from in those harvest seasons. However, in the long-term use of chemical fertilizers, um, by the way, chemical fertilizers are imported by the government um, into the Gambia and distributed freely to the farmers. So the long-term use of this eventually, and also ironically, depleted the soil. This, along with the salt infiltration and in increased hippo infestations into the farm, devastated Binta's rice farm, leading her to the, to the decision of abandoning her rice farming. So after being displaced for her, from her rice farming livelihood due to environmental degradation, 
caused by chemical fertilizers, Binta then carved out a small plot in a community vegetable garden within a nearby forest. There, she faced further challenges. The issue of soil depletion persists. And this is again rooted to the chemical fertilizer use. And also on top of that, her vegetable, uh, vegetable garden became attractive to cows and sheep and even baboons and monkeys that because of uh, forest denudation now run out of uh, their own uh, food, now, in, now invading the vegetable gardens of the community members. So this shows a cycle of environmental injustice, putting her income at risk and her family at risk of food insecurity. Not only are they not able to produce food for family consumption, they also now do not have enough money to buy them. So in facing the series of challenges Binta battled, we noticed an, an, an unexpected solution. The animals visiting her vegetable garden become uh, agents of change. The very presence of cows, sheep, and baboons uh, seen as nuisance became soil revitalizing agents. Their trampling on the ground help aerate the soil while their manure enrich the soil with nutrients essential for plant growth and also the remnants of the plants and the leaves litter they did not consume were pushed down into the soil, contributing to the organic matter, improving water retention and transforming the soil into fertile ground. This natural progression in nature led us to a sustainable path uh, forward pointing out how integrating ecological principles can turn challenges into solutions. But despite the benefits this animal uh, brings, they remain to be a threat to Binta's livelihood. I will talk more about that later in the discussion. In the meantime, Jan, you can talk about your experience. Yeah, thank you, Mariana. See the garden there. I'd like to take everyone on a trip this evening to West Africa, and I welcome you wherever you're tuning in from around the world. And for those who are watching from Florida, anywhere between Florida and Texas, the Caribbean, as you relax in your seats, I want you to be mindful that in the air around you, there were many, many tiny particles uh, that were swept across the Atlantic Ocean from Africa. And for a farming family in West Africa, they are oblivious to the impact that their farming practices might have on the lungs of people far, far away. In the summer months from space, you can see the massive dust storms that sweep across from West Africa to North America. When I first met Ndei Chao, who you see here 15 years ago, uh, she was not focused on climate, but rather survival. She was a peanut farmer whose family suffered from chronic hunger every year when the peanuts and the millet ran out. Monocrop farming had turned her fields to dust and made her desperate to find a new way to feed her family. She was a very spiritual and passionate woman. People in her community still tell the tale about how she flew through the village like an Olympic athlete, uh, chasing down Omar, my lifelong uh, brother and Peace Corps friend, and he was on a motorcycle uh, but she wanted to secure her spot in the program. The life tree system starts by planting a living fence. So you see in Day Child here, we visited her recently, and uh, the system starts by planting this living fence and creating a perimeter all the way around the farm with thorny trees that act as a protective barrier, not just to the goats and livestock, but also the warthogs, monkeys, and even hippos. Uh, that Mariama mentioned earlier. It protects from weather extremes, and here you can see it from above, how it forms a protective barrier around it and uh, allows for diversity to thrive. Mother Trees was born about 20 years ago when Omar and I, seen here, first started going village to village on donkey carts planting trees. And today, Mother Trees is working with thousands of people to help them succeed in the tree economy. People just like in Natal. The diverse agroforestry is better for her family, it's better for the land, it's better for all biodiversity, 
It's better for the watershed and the soil, and it makes families more climate resilient. It reduces toxins in our ecosystem. And at the heart of our program is a new seed lending model called and through seed banks. And through this network of seed banks, we lend the right trees, their seeds to farmers, and then they learn how to grow these prolific agroforests. And they in turn return seven times the amount of seed borrowed back into the seed bank. Biodiversity for a livable climate helped finance the first seed bank that you see here. And the 24 million tree program in Senegal is now underway. So thank you, Biodiversity for a Livable Climate. You can see the inside of it here. We're gonna fill those shelves. This is more than a tree planting program, but a movement building. Our goal is to change the way farmers support themselves across West Africa and beyond, restoring tree cover to degraded lands on hunger-stricken landscapes that are currently on the verge of desertification. By restoring degraded landscapes, we will all be able to breathe better, literally and metaphorically. As the climate impacts the crops, the land also impacts the climate. The increased tree cover cools the land, moisture dense clouds are attractive, not repelled, and the trees bring the rain. In the forest gardens created through the Life Tree program, it's several degrees cooler under these trees. These trees slow the wind, increase moisture, build the soil with leaf litter, fix nitrogen, and store water that fell in the rainy season in fruit that ripens in the dry season. By planting trees, farmers can plant water and grow rain. Integrating trees into a farming system also saves biodiversity in countless ways. This is where the magic comes together. Farmers are most concerned with wildlife such as warthogs, monkeys, and hippos entering into their farms. And so, as John said, the strong acacia living fence surrounding the garden protects thousands of farms by reducing conflict between people and wildlife. Many small niches throughout the life tree system provide habitat for lizards, birds, butterflies, and many other species. Small wildlife find a home in this re-established ecosystem. Pollinators then provide nourishment back into the garden. We are so excited to invite investment in our new beekeeping program in addition to the growing seed bank network. Mother Tree's Life Tree System is a permaculture that converts degraded land into a lasting and living legacy. I hope everybody enjoyed that short trip to West Africa today. For me personally, it was a dream come true when I visited with John late last year. Even though I have connected with John uh, many years ago, I have never had the opportunity to visit the forest gardens and connect with the farmers and um, learn about how the forest gardens come to life. It was an absolutely life-changing experience for me, and especially from a conservation perspective, to be able to appreciate how uh, biodiversity flourishes along with the advancement of the forest gardens as the years progress and they establish. As soon as you step into the forest garden, you can appreciate, you can feel, you can hear and sense life blooming all around you. Birds chirp, you can feel the butterflies fluttering and bees buzzing. And these are just some of the few species that are brought back to life and um, are an essential part of this component in these micro ecosystems. So the impact, as you all can appreciate, that the life tree system has is not only on the farmers, on the community, and the degraded landscape, as well as reducing this human-wildlife conflict. But this change, this impact permeates through our entire planet as an all-encompassing solution to the threats that we are currently fa facing. So I ask, I invite everybody to please consider a donation. We will have... Um, our social media platforms up at the end of the presentation for you to follow and like our content and visit our website. Mariama, I'll turn it back to you. 
Yeah. So now I will share my thoughts on the living fence as a solution. Um, first, while the living fence is just growing around the farms, um, in the video that John and Pam showed, um, the perimeter of the farm is planted with um, native plants, right? Uh, while they are just growing, they are actually already building biodiversity. In this system that uses rows of a variety of native plant species that attract beneficial insects and wildlife, actually creates balanced ecosystem already. S while they are still growing, they also, they also improve soil structure by preventing soil erosion and promoting the development of healthy soil microbiomes through the de decomposition of organic matter from plants. The vegetation in living fences increases um, water retention in the soil by reducing the surface runoff and shading the ground, which actually helps um, conserve moisture. Now, once they reach a height of uh, around five to six feet, they become a formidable farm fortress, providing defense against crop damage from hippopotamus, live um, cows, sheep, and other livestock, and even unwelcome human intrusion. But most importantly for Binta and our work in the Gambia, living fences enable faster pollination that leads to more efficient fertilization of flowering plants, resulting in higher yields. This increase in productivity directly enhances the volume of the harvest and also allow farmers to sell more of their produce and consequently uh, that results to larger quantity of goods uh, to market so that farmers like Binta can significantly boost their income, contributing to the economic um, stability and also growth for their household and the communities as well as for the country. Regarding seed bank, uh, Jan talked about seed banking. Uh, seed banking, this is a place where seeds are deposited and stored to make them available to farmers and the general public who are interested in planting these native plants for living fences, right? Now, to ensure the longevity and accessibility of sustainable solutions like living fences, um, integrating the private sector is key. By enabling the small business involvement, solutions become self-sustaining. For instance, Mother, Mother Trees is creating a seed bank for living fences in Senegal, which is excellent. My organization, TEFA, can take it further by enabling individuals to become entrepreneurs in their own right. Like one of the um, beneficiaries of Mother Trees, Omar, she, he can actually manage the seed bank as his business and Binta to trade seeds and offer planting services within their respective communities far away from where the seed bank is. In this way, we proliferate the adoption of living fences as in other agricultural technologies much faster and more uh, in a more efficient way. Um, this step approach secures the continuation of eco-friendly practices and empowers local economies, making sustainability a community-driven approach. Over to you, Beck. Ah, thank you, uh, John, Miriama, and Pam. What a very interesting and uh, successful program. Kind of a lead, a lead in question, maybe to talk a little bit more about what is actually needed to implement these solutions and what is the high level advice to integrate these projects and get beyond just single crop projects. Uh, is that something, John, that you want to talk about? Or? Sure, I'd be happy to. I've been I've been struggling on that for for you know decades now, and I, I think it's uh, what, what's really needed as as you enter into a degraded landscape that's that where most of the farmers are currently growing one or very few crops um, is you know you 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 need to find your early adopters or your lead farmers or your demo sites or your wins to to start bringing and showing new new uh, systems that people have never seen before. Um, and you also need to work on a seed supply and building seed. And uh, oftentimes the seed supply has been decimated and farmers can only get access to the one or few crop seeds 
uh, that they're encouraged to grow, but a lot of the rest of the seeds have been lost in the forestry trees and the fruit trees and all. So um, getting the seed supply out and, um, you know, communications, there's all kinds of communications that need to happen. Uh, farmers are farmers, not foresters, but it's not a big jump from growing, you know, food crops into into becoming an agroforester. They need some encouragement. Uh, they need to see some examples and and see that it's possible. And then once you once you get your your lead farmers go, and then the movement can grow from there. I've, here's a really good question that I've wondered about: How do you provide the water for the initial tree planting, and then how long does it take for those trees to get to that five foot? We've I always designed two years. We've always designed things to we pick species and design things to minimize the water needs. So you want to grow your trees, ideally a, a couple months, two, three months before the rains even come and you're pulling water from a well. But we keep our nurseries very small if you have to do a backyard nursery. Um, we're also direct seeding trees so that we don't have to do we skip the nursery stage altogether. And we're finding ways, even if people don't have running water, that if their their field is far from running water, there's still an arid mix of trees that are hardy uh, to the zone, and they might not be able to do citrus that requires a lot of, of, of water, for example, but there's a, a whole hardy mix of trees and helping in the, in the species selection is important as well. So once your trees have that first rainy season in the field, usually then they're and they survive that first rainy se dry season, then they're they're ready to uh, survive without irrigation the rest of their life. And those fence trees, how long until they're an effective fence? Into the second year, um, if you plant it early enough, sometimes it's into the third year, we pick acacia uh, trees and others that are medium to fast growing so that farmers can uh, hopefully uh, protect their field in, in a relatively short time. Um, in order to stop the hippopotamus, it's probably four year, five year acacia and nilotica trees and others that, that help keep the hippopotamuses out. But the rest of the trees, we plant them close together, we prune them at the top, they branch out, they're nice and thorny, they've got thorns sometimes going in both directions, and they'll keep a lot, a lot of things out. Um, and the, right now the warthogs are a big headache, but they keep the warthogs out of out of fields in Katigu, Senegal, for example, and, and we mentioned the monkeys and the sheep and the goats and the livestock have always been uh, the biggest nuisance, but they uh, they're pretty pretty strong. Are they, those thorny trees are they thorny enough that they're safe, or do they also need to be protected while they're seedlings? Um, goats are goats are the biggest challenge, I'd say. You know, usually a goat will just chew on it and even spit it out if it's not 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 yummy to eat. So we do need to protect the trees even within that first year. When you plant the small seedlings and you see them coming, um, if there is a way to keep the animals away, you're visiting the field every day, you're chasing 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 the cows away. And day child, oh my goodness, we she could spend hours <laughs> talking about chasing the cows away. So it it requires some effort. Some people put a stick fence all around their fence and say stick fence well it's the last stick fence they'll ever make but you do it and then you start you know growing your living fence um on the inside and um just it's it's a you know two-year transition and it's hard for us to imagine but once you i mean africa is famous for having herders you walk their livestock you know across the landscape eating and trampling and, and causing all kinds of problems but once you protect your field, the living fences are so transformational and it's worth the effort because farmers can finally start upgrading their crops for the very first time and go away from the poor people crops of the cereals and the peanuts and things like that, where nobody ever makes any money off of those and get into higher value horticulture and things that that people people can make more of a livelihood off of. And I just wanted to share a fun fact, funny story from our last visit. Uh, acacia trees, they are so, so thorny and they have like double directed thorns that our videographer uh, got caught in one of those and he couldn't get himself out of it. So I wish I had the blooper, the clip to show you all. Uh, so they're thornier than you would expect or think. Yeah. Well, and I remember we talked about how that compares to a program that, for instance, would use barbed wire to try to keep out grazing animals and right. uh, how that is not as good a solution because it degrades, it rusts, it needs to be replaced, it has to be imported. Uh, so growing this fence uh, is really important. There are a lot of great questions in Q&A, but I know we do have a few more closing remarks that we wanted to get to, uh, and then we'll come back to the rest of the questions. 
Uh, Mariama, did you did you want to wrap up a little bit about the program? Right. So you know, back um, around the globe, um, impactful development interventions like the ones we are doing in the Gambia and what Mother Tree is doing in Senegal. Um, they are wonderful, shaping brighter future for us, right? Um, they, these are also very commendable efforts. However, I think there is a need to complement this um, development efforts towards a more sustainable actions, um, emphasizing the creation of livelihoods and meaningful partnership with small businesses. I think this is the basis for providing the necessary goods and services. You asked um, in one of your questions, um, uh, what can we do, right? Um, I think that we need to we may we need to make this solution available to the public at a much larger um, um, uh, audience, right? So for example, not only in Senegal, not only in the Gambia, but na neighboring countries countries as well who are experiencing the same type of uh, problem. And the solution is involving small businesses um, that will provide these services without uh, mother trees in the area. This business, these small businesses will provide the seeds, will, will collect the seeds, and also will provide the knowledge, the know-how on how to do things. Um, and I think that the key to lasting change really is engaging the private sector as a partner in our development work. Now, to integrate this essential component into your development projects for our audience and for um, uh, Bio for Climate as well as for Mother Trees, um, now or in the future, you can reach us. Uh, to, you can reach out to us at Tefa. We are specialists in nurturing small businesses and ensuring the sustainability of environmental and community development initiatives. Thank you. Thank you, Mar thank you, Mariama. Uh, I, this is a good connecting point because we have said that you know what what is a key component for environmental justice, and to me, that is empowering a community to be self-sufficient. And I think John has a little bit to share about how how he's been working on that same same issue that you were talking about, Mariama. Yeah, I, uh, you know, I, I think as I look at, um, you know, the state of, of ecosystems around the world, really agribusiness approaches have, have destroyed environments. And, and the agribusiness, the traditional agribusiness approach is trying to maximize profits. And that's why we have all these agrochemicals and intensification and all. Uh, what, what I've described this evening um, was in Dei Chow, and she's one woman. Uh, but what we have after all these, I've been doing this for 20 years, is agricultural cooperatives. And I think tonight the theme that, that we at Mother Trees really want to emphasize for, for Senegal and everywhere is cooperative driven landscape restoration. I mean, people working together in collective action, creating jobs for themselves and agroforestry cooperatives so that they continue to, 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 to gain income and, and have revenue um, is, is critically important. Doing that in a sustainable way because agriculture, as we started this evening, agriculture and our farming systems are really destroying the planet. So how do we shift from agribusiness back to agriculture. Um, the culture in agriculture is really all the techniques that have been lost with the monocropping, but in the in older indigenous growing systems and now in this new agroforestry systems that we're bringing back the culture in a community is the food sharing and the techniques you do and all the harvesting and all the things throughout the year that you use. In addition to the food, it's the firewood and the fiber and the and the things and the saps and the honeys and the and the, all the culture around it and we want to see culture come back you know in into into in, into farming and um you know i i think our our system here by showing how people can work together to pull their resources and um self-invest and self-fund some of their uh, agroforestry initiatives is, is a wonderful pathway that, that we look forward to telling more people about. 
And John, you mentioned to me that a a key end point of that is not just subsistence farming, but then being able to have uh, products that can be sold and create industry in the the village and the community. And somebody asked about additional programs like beekeeping and water retrieval systems, those sorts of things. They're all important. In the life tree system, the family should have something to eat, sell, or trade every single month of the year. You know, it's not this old mentality where the here in the United States, a wheat farmer or soy might have one or two big kind of harvesting paydays a year. Now, that's incredibly difficult to manage your family off of one payday, um, and especially when it's tiny. Uh, in our system, we're looking to have yeah multiple things kind of generating income and, and, and diversifying, and it really is strength and diversity. It works for household economics, and it also works for the environment. Yeah, John, I could not agree with you more. So, for example, in the Gambia, um, when it's closer to the planting season, uh, at the beginning of the rain, I'm sure it's the same in Senegal, the government purchase buy from outside the country seeds that is distributed to the farmer, rice seeds, maize, corn, corn seeds, peanut seeds that are distributed to the farmer. And this is done every year. I mean, it, I think it is empowering to enable the communities uh, gather uh, their own seeds and sell their own seeds. I think this is uh, very much empowering. I think whenever we hear about a great program like this, everyone wonders why isn't it being done everywhere already? And a couple of the specific questions that we, we got in the Q&A box were, you know, is it is it government? Is government being supportive? Is it just funding? Are there uh, mechanisms to share this knowledge across different groups or different countries? And so maybe just a little bit more detail on. I've gone to the World Food Prize in Iowa, where all of the biggest companies and people in world agriculture come together each year to share the best ideas and that entire world is hijacked by corporate interests and big agribusinesses who are spending millions of dollars every day to take over developing countries and sell seed to every single farmer in Senegal, in Gambia, in Bangladesh, in Nigeria. So our challenge is not that the farmers don't want to do good for themselves and the, and, and the land. And, and the, every farmer we talk to is heartbroken, passing on this degraded plot of land to his or her son, saying, here you go, son. I, uh, I'm giving you a degraded plot that has nothing on it because I was convinced to do peanuts for 75 years. And that's all I've been able to do. They want legacy. They want a living legacy to be able to pass a fruit trees and fruit tree portfolio. And it, it that's what you would want. That's what I would want. Uh, the enabling environment is very, in agriculture, it has so many of uh, these other interests that have infiltrated and want to sell the, the fertilizers or they want to sell the seed or they want to sell something that uh, the, 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 it's the kind of, I think that's the biggest challenge. It's not that the government agents aren't, aren't ready you know, to adopt environmentally sustainable things, or it's not that the farmers or that there's not enough NGOs or anything else. I think it's really the private sector agribusinesses and the food paradigm, the the green revolution paradigm. We can't shake it. Yeah, not to mention, I'd like to add, uh, Jen, that no no individual farmer, no societies, no communities had ever developed uh, from you know a certain income to another to a higher level out of monocropping. And the development trend right now, international development is all about, okay, we want to develop the rice sector. Better okay, mother. we want to develop the groundnut sector. Yeah. We haven't really, uh, as an international development effort, talk about, okay, in your half an hectare plot of land, what and what can we plant there so that you increase the income of that individual farmer? That, I think, is a, a discussion that we need to have. And maybe that addresses a couple other questions I saw here uh, around Monsanto and GMA, GMO seeds. Uh, you know, if the government's giving out seeds, that sounds like a good thing, but it sounds like they're giving out monoculture. Uh, but people also asked, are those, are the government seeds GMO seeds? And has Monsanto uh, blocked any of the efforts at seed banking? 
I know that um, Monsanto in its various kind of forms is is buying up seed companies throughout Africa and and around the world, buying up organic seed companies and and taking more and more control over the seed supply. Um, So I think some of the African countries, I believe Kenya, for example, has approved GMOs. And I think that there's also some pushback from other from other places. And whereas, you know, there might be some benefits to, to some of the 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 the, modif- the genetic modifications that might help with either fungus stuff or some other bugs or pests. Uh, those same organ uh, seeds have also been modified. They didn't leave it there. They also put in the Roundup Ready gene. So that no matter what the other stuff, I'm Irish, leery, and they always say, oh, we wouldn't have this potato blight if we had the, the genetically modified blah, blah, blah. Well, yeah, but they didn't just modify that. There's also Roundup Ready so that all of the GMOs are, are, are seeded with, you know, glyphosate and all of these other potentially cancer-causing herbicides and stuff like that, too. So, again, the, they, they, there's a lack of culture and ethics, and um, I think business is 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 hard to compete in in the GMO world. It's it's really just optimizing profits. So, Pam or John, can you? I'm not sure if you got to mention the scale of the project. Like, how many farms are involved, and in how you see this growing in the next couple of years, or? So excited! I've been on calls. I'm on calls every single day, and I welcome more. And <laughs> Super more busy as, as we exactly as we as we build it. Um, we have a, a specific plan for our first 24 million, 30 million. It's 24 to 30 million trees in Senegal over just the next two to three years alone. Uh, we have a pipeline of 90 million trees that we're looking for sponsorships for. Um, in Senegal, we've got 6,000 farmers. Uh, in the region, in one region where Pam and I visited, and we've got another four, five, six thousand that we're we're, we're assembling the list right now um, in Kadegu, Senegal. So the 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 demand is there. I've been doing this for twenty years. I've worked with thousands and thousands and thousands of farmers. We already have three thousand five hundred in Senegal that have the beautiful uh, life tree system, just like Benin Chow showed us earlier, and. Uh, they're all ready. I've never met one that says, no, I don't want to plant trees. Like every farmer loves the system. It's an obvious um, thing. So we do need to communicate the solution more broadly, internally, in and across Africa. And I think initiatives like our seed bank is really going to be the other thing that helps to spur uh, and enable and empower people to say, oh, okay, I want to do that. Well, we'll get the seeds in their hands and they can do it. I just want to add. Um, back, sorry, before you come in, I just want to add that in most of Africa, the um, the activity of rice farming, vegetable farming, is uh, belong they it it belongs to the domain of women. Women are the ones farming uh, rice and also growing uh, vegetables. And so this uh, living fence solution actually. Uh, takes out that burden from um, from women. Uh, that is one one thing that is beautiful about uh, this living fence as well. And also, ninety uh, percent of the fuel cooking um, cooking fuel that we use, uh, not only in the Gambia, not only in Senegal, most of Africa are still using firewood and charcoal for for fuel. This living fence, the dried uh, branches, actually. The women, women, they don't have to go far to collect branches for for their farming. So it's really beautiful. I love hearing that. Um, I had another question for you, John. It slips in my mind. <laughs> oh, we had a brief discussion about how this could apply in places other than Africa, sure. and I, I thought your approach would was very useful. And maybe you want to share that with the audience. Yeah, I, the the agroforestry system I've described this evening was was it it didn't just it wasn't just born in Senegal and and it was inspired by agroforestry excellence in Central America, South America, Southeast Asia. I looked at rice rice pineapple coconut systems in the Philippines, and you look at cocoa coffee fruit tree hardwood systems in in Honduras and other places and. Um, have always designed these methodologies so that whether we're, we're, and we are, Mother Trees is in Senegal, we're going to start in Gambia soon, we're in Tanzania, uh, we're in Haiti. Um, It needs to to work. 
uh, no matter what the context, whether you're on the hillside or down below. And the way to do that is now that we figured out what the future form of agriculture should look like, that's regenerative, helps biodiversity and is best for the planet. We say, um, we've put this life tree process together and it's just asking the right questions and, and, and going through the, the right steps of protecting your field and planting trees that improve the soil, putting fruit trees that feed the family, and then trees growing up above and trees growing down below. And all of these different elements might be very different um, if you're in Senegal or even Gambia, but the general framework of the design, you know, it, it stays the same. Is your field protected or does it need a fence? Do you have thorny trees? Which ones are you familiar with? Are there other things we can plant? You know, we, we walk people through the questions and then uh, Mariama just talked about all of the many multiple benefits from the living fence. And we walk through those questions. Are you have shortage on firewood? You need, is it, is it new? What are you looking at? Food, berries, we have vitamin C rich jujubes that, that grow on the thorny trees as well. Do you need more? Yeah. Do you need some other type of medicine, medicines or other things? And we can pick the trees in, in the system that meet those local needs and the market opportunities. They may say the jujubes are a big money maker. We want to grow as many jujube trees. Well, they're thorny. They would go in the living fence in that context. And someplace else, the acacia trees are working very well. Over in Tanzania, it's a very different species set that we work with, but it's the similar concept of protect your field with lots of thorny things and other things. And diversify with fruit trees in, in different rows. And so every life tree system looks a little different, but um, I've designed also in Haiti. And in Haiti, it's a women's cooperative, um, a women's honey cooperative, and they're all doing beekeeping. So the, the, the life tree system there is focused on optimizing honey production and food production from January to December. So yeah, it still has the living fence, but what does that living fence enable? It enables flowers for the bees from January to December. And so now we got, you know, more honey sales and they're making money off the wax candles and, and things like that too. So I do think that the, the system has, I, I, and I put my um, knowledge sciences, the learning sciences hat on, we talk about inquiry-based design and it's a good, it's kind of asking questions to draw out the experience and, the, and that people have saying, yes, that's a great idea, validating what what what, what people say. And, and when they don't, then you kind of kick the question around to the group. And at some point, the group answers it in the best way that's locally appropriate for them, too. So I think it's important. People want to know how, you know, how do these how are these things really kind of designed to scale and, and, and to be respectful of local cultures and languages and different uh, local environmental knowledges and other experience. And it's it's really by by asking all the right questions about and that that lead to some type of answer, some type of tree or some type of crop or some type of interaction that'll that'll help people. Yeah. And then I just wanted to add that for me, um, it was particularly fascinating on this last trip to actually get to appreciate the different stages in the evolution of the forest gardens because we got a chance to visit gardens that had you know, barely being established uh, less than a year ago. And then we got a chance to see those that had been established already for two or three years, four, five, and then 10 years. And then you can actually get a perspective of how that garden starts to evolve. And in the gardens that, you know, have like more than five or six years, you can appreciate what um, Mariama was mentioning about the firewood, where they're now able to collect the firewood and use that for cooking and not travel. Um, and so for for some of us that hadn't been there, I think the drone shots that we we show in 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 our video are uh, useful to to be able to appreciate that comparison between forest gardens that were just established recently and those that that have five plus ten years. That's so interesting, Pam. I love that perspective, and I really want to uplift your role too in helping capture video and tell the story. Because uh, it's so important not just to tell the story to the rest of the world, but to share it within the communities as well that uh, might be learning. And so that's some beautiful, beautiful work that you you and your team have been doing. So thank you. Thank you so much, Vic. You are welcome. I also had a question, John, you mentioned to me a learning caravan, uh, a question. So this is kind of a 
wrapping up some different ideas about what role does does village leadership play or tribal leadership and how are, you know, as opposed to outsiders teaching this, how are people within the community spreading the word and uh, being part of that? Yeah, I, 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 I had the great pleasure, Pam and I, in our, in our last trip, we had leaders from across the landscape putting together landscape partnerships. Um, village chiefs from every village, the leaders of the farming cooperatives. We had the forestry committee there. We had the religious leaders there, the, the forestry department, you know, the, the, the forest guardians. And we got all the leaders from across the landscape um, together. And um, sorry, Beck, I blanked on your question here real quick. <laughs> so are they teaching each other? Is there a method yeah. that this and is what, spreading virally. What we've described here is just as new to everybody that's watching this evening as it is to farmers there who said, I've been a peanut farmer for 60 years and projects have come in and tried to help with this or help with that. So there is a, a communication challenge at first um, because we have enough successes, real living successes that people and we've had the ministers come, we've had high level people we're uh, in, in agriculture um, and ministry of the environment and uh, guardians. Yeah, trying to get more and more on TV. And, and, and so hopefully this new paradigm of agroforestry uh, will be a little bit easier. But there's a there's a there's a, a bit of a, a step in the beginning of really kind of, you know, helping people to understand and, and gain confidence in, in a very new and, and different form of farming. Uh, once we can get that and, and we'll put people on buses, you mentioned the learning caravan, seeing is believing. And at first I used to have to put people on a bus and we would drive six hours to see an example. And now we just have to drive, you know, five minutes down the street and we've got, we've got, you know, hundreds of examples to see. So um, that, that, that takes a bit of community building and, and meeting with people to, to help create that new vision. Um, you're talking about forests with people who haven't really seen thick forests before in the, and or agroforestry for farmers who haven't seen it as well. And um, so I think w once we do get then we've, we've got, you know, tremendous support from from our local leaders and from cooperatives. And and despite the other public sector people that we mentioned, I think Mariam was right. We continue to have a very kind of market based approach here and to try to be very business like as we pull our biz business, um, you know, business leaders in as well. Miriam, is that the same with your program or do you have some other, anything to add to that? Yes, um, the governance issue is, is something else. So in my experience um, in the Gambia, um, there are efforts that, you know, we think that are good, but the leadership in the community, usually Alcalo and the uh, village development committees um, will not accept. And, and that is political. Um, the approach, really what John uh, mentioned earlier, of discussing with them before, before even discussing with the uh, village community members, um, this what uh, paved the way for acceptance uh, at the village level. Thank you. And speaking of political issues, I, uh, this will be our last question, I believe, and then we'll uh, share a little bit more information about how to stay involved. Uh, how do you work in areas that are experiencing war? And I bring this up because unfortunately, it's a real issue and and, and spreading. Have you had that experience? Is it possible? Very um, interesting. To me, that, that question is very interesting. I am working on um, my paper right now at um, Brandeis um, on supporting small businesses that are operating in conflict zone. Mm -hmm. So, um, and, and this is even more important because these um, businesses that are op operating in the conflict zone, these are catalytic businesses. They are operating there, they provide job, but also they provide food and uh, services needed by that community to just survive. So it's very important. So operating, uh, introducing this kind of um, uh, technology in this kind of situation, I think is also very, um, very important. Uh, maybe a, a perimeter 
uh, maybe some some meters away from the really danger zone. What do you think, John? Yeah, I, uh, I I've I've been able to work in some you know some challenging um, conflict prone areas. Right now in Haiti, uh, we're dealing with internally displaced people who are uh, leaving Port-au-Prince uh, because of all of the conflict there and moving into the rural areas where, where we're working. And, and we're looking at how can we better accommodate people as they come. Um, in, in Central Africa, in the past in Cameroon and other places, I've also kind of dealt with, with refugees. And you know, they, there's oftentimes this thought that people are gonna come and then maybe they'll go back at some point. But no, I think the, the, the experience shows that when people are pushed away out of their home, they use wherever they land, the, the camps never close. Um, I mean, and even as you look at Palestine, I mean, I would try to, I worked with the, inter, or, let me get to this, International Rescue Committee had the great pleasure of going to Central African Republic, which continues to be a, a war zone. There's 13, you know, kind of warlords of sorts throughout the country that have all kinds of armed militias. And and, and in there, I, I went and... Um, designed an agroforestry for the life, you know, just like what we we're talking about this evening that met the needs of, of local community. The living fence helps protect the field and protect the gardens. Um, it's, it was very, you know, it was well received and, and people had a lot of interest in, in protecting their area. Um, the markets, even though uh, we're not talking about a you know, heavy war zone, I mean, this is frequent conflict, the markets are still humming and buzzing. And so the, 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 the fruits and vegetables that people are growing within their protective enclaves are selling. It's the staple crops. We didn't have to do grafted avocados to make money or anything you know, particularly complicated. It was just a lot of staple crops and foods in that type of situation you described are valuable. And, um, you know, so uh, there, there was some an opportunity for people to earn money in post-conflict conflict times uh, with with the crops that, that are growing in there as well. So it's a challenge, certainly, but I'd be happy to talk for hours more on it. <laughs> I can see that. Yeah, yeah. I, mean, I mean, it's even, it's needed even more where there is conflict to create a livelihood for, for themselves, you know. Thank you. Well, it is about seven o'clock. You may think that means we're out of time, but GBH is very generous to give us a few extra minutes to wrap up. So I'd like to give uh, Pam an opportunity to share a little bit about where they're going next and how you can be involved. And I think you have a couple of slides that'll help uh, people get the information. Thank you so much, Beck. Yes, I'd like to share with everybody. We just launched our website and our Instagram page recently. So I encourage everybody to follow us there. We're uh, focusing our efforts, our communication efforts um, on updates and our trips we'll be doing this year. We have a very busy year ahead of us, so we encourage you to sign up for our newsletter to stay up to date on everything that we'll be doing moving forward. And of course, we invite everybody to consider uh, a donation today. You can scan that QR code you see on screen and those donations will be directed towards our seed bank um, and future seed banks, hopefully. I hope you do have an opportunity to donate. Uh, we certainly think it's a great investment to help launch these seed banks. Any other closing words uh, from John, Mariama? You don't have to have them, but if you do. <laughs> Just thank, want to thank everyone for joining us this evening. It's been it's been a great pleasure to uh, see all the all the energy that's building. I think the the world is is demanding better of our food systems, and and we know what to do. So we're we're happy to keep kind of building this movement together. So thanks everyone for joining us. Miriam. Thank you, everyone, uh, for joining us in this very important conversation. Thank you, Beck, for this opportunity to be with you here tonight. And thank you, GBH. And thank you is the last word. Thank you to our panelists. Uh, what a fascinating conversation uh, and around a really powerful program that is going on uh, for this food security. And I like to thank GBH, always a great partner in our Life Saves the Planet series. And you know where to find us at www.bio4climate.org and we will see you at our next talk.
Thank you, everyone.